Today we're going to talk about soils. Soils are weathered and eroded, and then the sediments are deposited and they turn into soils. Um, soil, along with water and air, are going to be our most valuable resources that we have here on Earth. If we think about why that is for a minute, um, plants put their roots in soil, get their nutrients from soil. Without soils, there'd be no plants. Without plants, there's going to be no animals. Without plants and animals, there's going to be no humans. So we need to preserve our soil. It's important that we learn about soil so that we can learn what types of soil are the best for plant life and for sustaining human life. Characteristics of soil. Um, soil weathering and erosion creates a layer of rock and mineral fragments, which is called the regolith. This is a vocabulary word you need to become familiar with right here. So speaking of the earth from the inside out, um, we have our crust and all of that is going to make up the regolith, including the soil. And then the soil is going to be the top part of this regolith that supports plant growth. So inside the regolith is part of that is going to be the bedrock or the hard layer, which has no soil. Plants don't grow in. Um, so our regolith is the bigger area and soil is that small top area. Soil composition, it has four main components that we're going to talk about here in just a minute. Um, mineral matter and broken down rocks. Humus and organic matter. Humus, another word that you're going to need to become familiar with. Um, so our organic matter just means matter from something that was living. A lot of people here confuse organic with fresh. Because in the grocery store, if you buy organic tomatoes, they're farm-grown natural tomatoes. But organic means alive, not natural. It needs to have water and it needs to have air. If we look at the perfect soil composition, which is what this pie chart represents right here, we're going to have about 25% air, 25% water, and 50% other stuff um, making up our organic matter and our mineral and rock particles. Um, this organic matter or humus, again, is going to be the key component to sustaining life in soil. Air and water exist in soils in the pores. If you think about your skin, you have pores on your skin, which is where you sweat and where your hairs come out. Um, pores in the soil are going to be very similar, just little holes in soil where our air can seep in and our water goes in. To have quality soil, we need to have humus to provide that those nutrients. So this humus, again, is our organic material, once living material. It also provides pore for airs and water. Water is going to allow for our chemical reactions necessary for plant growth to take place. So if you think back to biology, maybe sixth grade, um, and photosynthesis, water is a key component to plant growth because it lets all of those other chemical reactions a plant does to create energy take place. And then air is going to be the source of carbon dioxide, which again is needed for photosynthesis. We have two different types of soil here. Which of these soils do you think would be most productive? Okay, so this bottom one would want, and why is that? If you notice, it's got all of this organic material. We can see the stuff growing. But as this organic material dies, it gets decayed by organisms. And now we have this really nutrient-rich, dark-colored soil. Over here, we have more of a desert, desert temperate soil. Um, there's no humus or organic matter on the top. It looks pretty sandy. Um, probably not very good for sustaining life. Our texture. We're going to talk about that sandy soil here again. So soils contain particles of different sizes. They're classified as sand, silt, and clay. You might remember these words from our rock slab. Um, these sand, silt, and clay can eventually make different types of rocks. So we use them to classify sedimentary rocks as well. So this picture is not to scale. I've blown it up so you can see the relationship of sizes of these particles. But our particle sizes come in clay, silt, sand, um, sands. These are all three different types of sands. And then we've got gravel and rock, which aren't really soil, but important to know nonetheless. So our clay is going to be this little tiny black dot right here. And its particle diameter is less than 0 0.002 millimeters. I'd make sure I got all of this down right here. Silt will need be the next largest. 
And then we've got fine sand, medium sand, and coarse sand. After that, we'll have gravel and rocks. If you wanted to, you could just clump all three of these sands into one category. You don't really need to know much more than that for this chapter. Here's another picture, our clay. If you magnified these particles, again, they'd be less than 0 0.002 millimeters. Our silt is going to be a little bit bigger than the clay, and the final cutoff diameter is 0 0.05 millimeters. And then after that, we have our sand. And this sand looks like it's mixed with fine, coarse, and medium grain. Next thing that we're going to talk about is this um, soil texture diagram. You don't need to draw this diagram, but this has the percent silt, percent clay, and percent sand. And it's going to tell us predominantly what our soil is made out of. So if we have a bunch of sand and very little silt and clay, we're going to be over here in the sand. If we have a lot of silt and very little thing, everything else, we're going to be over here in silt. And if we have predominantly clay and less of everything else, we're going to be up here. To get the best soils, we desire to be right here in this middle area in the loam. So loam is where all of our plants are going to grow the best. So let's say for an instance that we had 30% sand and 80% silt and 20% clay, we'd be right on the edge of this loam. Let's see if you guys can do one. What type of soil consists of 10% clay, so we'll find our clay, 10% clay, 60% silt, so we're going to follow this line right here over till we hit the line for 60% silt, which is going to be right there, and 30% sand. So then we've got to find our percent sand, and we're right at 30. So if we had 10 clay, 60 silt, and 30 sand, we'd be in this silt loam area. How does this affect plant life? Again, loam is the best for plant life. It's going to be this area right here with a mixture of everything. Our sand all the way over here is going to drain water too quickly, so it's not going to retain that water that's necessary for plant life. Um, and then roots are going to have a hard time penetrating clay and silt. Because our clay and silt particles are so small, they smush together more easily because they have um, smaller edges. And then that's going to create a thick, dense layer that roots for plants can't get into. Soil structure. Soil particles form clumps to give soil its structure. Um, and this structure determines how easily it can be cultivated or taken and used for other things, how susceptible it is to erosion, and the ease at which water can penetrate through the soil. Um, this, in turn, is going to influence the nutrients um, that get to plant roots. The most important factors of soil formation. We've got five things we're going to go over. Parent material, time, climate, organisms, and slopes. Let's start with parent material. Parent material um, is the source of mineral material in soil. Just like in the rocks lab with metamorphic rocks, how our metamorphic rock came from a parent rock, same thing here. So we have two types of parent material for our soil, residual soil and transported soil. Our residual soil, um, residual means like leftover, so it's what's left over on the bedrock. And then transported soil, transported means to move, so this is the soil that's getting moved. So it's getting moved and deposited by gravity, water, wind, or ice, and it forms on this unconsolidated deposits. All unconsolidated means is that they're still kind of all jumbly, they haven't turned into soil yet. So if we look at this picture right here, We've got our basalt bedrock, a part of the regolith, not the soil. And then on top here, we've got this residual soil. This soil came directly from this bedrock right here. On the other hand, in this picture, we have all of this lovely soil on the edges of our delta. So this soil comes from down the river as the river's going Soil and rocks are getting eroded and weathered, and they're getting deposited finally down here. This soil down here 
isn't closely going to resemble the rock that it started from because it's getting so weathered and picking up so many other things as it goes. Effects of parent material on soil. So the weight, rate of weathering. Unconsolidated soils are already weathered, so they have more surface area for chemical weathering. We did a lab on this on Monday with the chalk. So the more weathered our chalk was, the smaller pieces it was in, the more readily it reacted to chemical weathering. So more of it reacted. So our unconsolidated soil up here, these grains, have more surface area. So when we get dead plants or organisms um, having chemical reactions on them, or maybe we get some carbonate materials or some acid rain, they're going to become more weathered. The rate of soil formation. Transported soil develops faster than residual soil. So because of that river in the other picture, it's flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing and carrying more and more things with it and it's chipping off rock edges. Um, this transported soil is going to get deposited more quickly at the bottom and it's going to form faster than just the mechanical weathering of this soil up here. So this has so many more factors acting on it than this residual soil. And then the composition of the parent rock. So chemical makeup of the parent rock determines how fertile the soil is going to be. Um, so fertility influences the types of plants that a soil can support. So if we have like a soil made out of purely granite, it would probably be less fertile than that soil at the end of the delta. Time. More time equals thicker soil. This is pretty straightforward, exactly what you would think. Um, young soils are going to the parent material closely. It's likely that they're going to be very close to the parent material. And then our older soils are going to have many other influencing factors, climate, plant life, um, organisms, slope, all of these other things are going to make them look way different than the parent rock. Climate. Climate has the largest effect on soil formation. Different temperatures and precipitation affect the rate, depth, and type of weathering. So if we are in a hot, moist climate, our rate is going to increase. The depth of the soil will probably increase because we have a higher rate of soil formation. And the type of weathering will probably be likely to get more chemical. Whereas if we're in a very dry climate, we're only going to get mechanical weathering. The depth of the soil will be very shallow and the rate is going to be very slow. So in dry climates, we have a thin layer of mechanical weathering, this picture here of a desert. So wind might blow up some of our mineral and rock particles. It will leave us with a thin layer of likely sandy soil. Hot, wet climates are going to get thicker layers of chemically weathered soil. The thicker layers exist due to the constant heat and um, precipitation. Heat is going to speed up our chemical reaction, so our chemically weathering is going to happen faster. Organisms also have a huge effect on soil composition. Soils are ba named based on the natural vegetation. So we have forest soils, which are found in forests, prairie soils, which are found near the prairie, and a tundra soil, which would be found on the tundra. Um, all of these plant organisms are going to affect what type of stuff is in the soil. So plants are the main source of organic material and microorganisms break down decaying material to contribute to soil fertility. So we're going to look at this. Um, no, not yet. Just kidding. All right. Organisms. Burn organisms. Mix mineral and organic material together. This is a picture of an earthworm down here. And our little earthworm, as he digs through the earth, is going to mix this nice, organic, rich humus soil in with all the other layers to support plant life. Again, the humus is what is going to give plants its nutrients. In addition, all of these little tubes that he's making are going to provide spaces for air and water, which are essential for photosynthesis, um, thoroughly helping. Here's where we're going. Bacteria convert nitrogen into usable nitrogen compounds for plants. In biology, you might have studied the nitrogen cycle. I'm going to pull it up here in just a second. 
but if we look at the nitrogen cycle, certain types of bacteria take up nitrogen from the atmosphere and produce ammonia. Ammonia will provide nitrogen and a form plants can use. So if we look at this right here, this nitrogen fixing bacteria takes this nitrogen that the plants can't use, he picks it up from the atmosphere and he's going to turn it into a good type of nitrogen that the plant can use. In addition, um, these nitrogen fixing bacteria live both in soil and in the roots. So he could be on the roots or just out here in the soil, nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil. Um, and then there's another type of bacteria in the soil um, called nitrifying bacteria. And the nitrifying bacteria produce compounds called nitrates and nitrites which are made up of nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrate is the most common source of nitrogen for plants. So these guys um, right here, these nitrifying bacteria, take the ammonia from the nitrogen fixing bacteria and they're going to turn it into nitrates, which the plant can use um, as amino acids and proteins. So these bacteria are essential in producing good soil. Slope. Steep slopes, erosion is accelerated, little water is absorbed, thin to non-existent layers of soil. So on a steep mountainside, the water just runs down the mountainside instead of getting absorbed into the soil. And then our flat slopes have little erosion because the water isn't going to move. So the poor drainage, the land gets waterlogged and we're going to have a thick, dark, super moist soil. Slopes facing the south in the northern hemisphere receive more sunlight, where slopes facing the north receive less sunlight. So if we had a hill right here, north, south, which side would you expect to have more vegetation? Okay, so some of you might have said that the north sloping face receive less sunlight, so they'll receive less vegetation. But in actuality, our south facing slopes right here are going to be dry. And because they don't get very much water because it's on a slope, we're going to have very little plant growth. Whereas our northern facing slopes are going to have more vegetation because the sun isn't going to dry out what little water they do get. All right, can you? Please list these on the bottom of your notes. This will count as a summary. Can you list the four major components of soil? And can you describe how climate affects soil formation? That's it for us today. Have a good one.